right. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which time zone you're in. My name is Ferdos Karas. I'm speaking to you from Ottawa, Canada. And I have the great privilege of being back at Horasis, which I think is a very important forum uh, of thought leaders. And I'm always delighted to speak at Horasis. I give over 100 speeches a year, and, and I always look forward to this particular uh, forum because I enjoy very much the interactions I have with the people that attend the Horasis Forum. So our panel today is on fostering a shared global bounty. We have a few uh, questions that have been posed to us. I will not be reading out the distinguished panel's bios. I encourage each of you to please go and look at their bios, both on Terraces and then perhaps to Google them or to go on other platforms where you might find much more detail uh, about them. So then I'd rather have a discussion than read out uh, the very distinguished uh, backgrounds of each person. All I can tell you is that we're all in the technology space one way or the other, we're all in digital economy one way or the other, uh, and we all come at it from different perspectives, which means we should have a lively and interesting discussion. So let me start off with uh, a kind of two-minute summary of what I see as the digital economy as I used to travel around the world, I don't anymore. Uh, the Canadian border where I am is so close, uh, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to uh, start uh, traveling again like the rest of the world. And I'm hoping that uh, we, can all, uh, we can all start visiting each other in person, uh, even at the next Horacids conference, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where are we in the digital economy? It is estimated now, after COVID-19 and the pandemic that we've had, that 45% of the entire S&P 500, if you don't know what that is, that is the list of the largest 500 traded companies in the United States, 45% is associated with the digital economy. That means that the companies are either in the internet space or have an internet presence or get some, if not all, of their income from the internet and, and so on. I have been dealing with COVID-19 since the beginning. I'm a media producer. So I produced a lot of work on COVID-19 and the effects of COVID-19. Of course, many of them have been negative and have negatively impacted all of us. But there are two very positive outcomes in my opinion. The first is that we know now, if we didn't know before, more than ever, that we are all interconnected on this planet. What started in China has affected every single person on this planet, and it doesn't matter what your income is, it doesn't matter what language you speak, it doesn't matter which country you're national of, it has impacted us considerably around the world. That means that the world, I think, has become a smaller place over the last two years. It has actually shrunk, it has actually increased our in individual human interaction with each other around the world, it has obviously brought us together on platforms like this one that we're talking on today, which were not so prevalent before. And we are able to communicate around the world in a much easier way as a result. The second is that obviously many, many companies have had to become part of the digital economy. They had, we have seen everybody accelerate their plans. Some of them, some companies might have had plans for, let's say, the next five years. Well, suddenly, because of the pandemic, we've all had, all of us, whether individuals in personal capacities or professionally, we work for com companies or governments or any organizations, we've had to get online very quickly. Now, 
That means, that transformation means that we have both opportunities that have opened up and challenges that have opened up. And the challenges have been myriad. And we will talk about some of those challenges today. I should note, if you don't know, because you've been on harasses the whole uh, whole day, depending on which time you, you zone you're in, is that just a few hours ago, there was a major uh, breakdown on the internet uh, and many international organizations, financial institutions, especially media companies uh, that publish online, uh, Amazon, others, all had difficulties uh, because of a major outage uh, a couple hours ago. I believe it has uh, recently been fixed. But that again shows us, along with the headlines that we've seen that on cybersecurity where companies over and over again have been held up for ransom, uh, there are, that is what we see in the news, I'm sure it's just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many companies that do this very quietly and governments do this very quietly when they face a cybersecurity threat. And that brings us to one of our biggest themes, which we have been asked to talk about, and that is our individual identity and our, our trust in uh, what we are doing online. So in my capacity in making media, I helped, for example, UNICEF, the world's uh, United Nations Children's Fund, I created media for them to send to the entire global staff on how to safely interact on the internet, to look for the URLs of UNICEF, what to post, what not to post on the internet, and so on. So this was a campaign done by UNICEF on a global basis uh, in multiple languages. I believe I did it in six languages uh, to get their staff more attuned to the threats that exist on the internet. So they're both opportunities which I've talked about and their challenges. So with that brief introduction, three minute introduction, I'm now going to talk, uh, I turn it over to our distinguished panelists and then we will have an open discussion. During the open discussion, unlike other people who might chair sessions, I actually invite you to pose questions. I can see the chat, and if you pose questions, please don't take the microphone, just type your questions. If you pose questions, I'll be happy to circulate them to the panel and have a discussion going. So with that uh, middle introduction, I invite Norma to lead us off with her thoughts. Well, thank you so much for that. That was a wonderful introduction as we kick off the panel. And I too am thrilled to be here with Horaces today. I have always enjoyed participating uh, in, in this wonderful forum. Online is the best that we'll be doing for the moment, but looking forward to being back in person. You know, all the issues that you teed up today really um, are, are wonderful and fun ones because I've spent half my career both in the U.S. government as an executive at, you know, within the State Department, the Commerce Department, working on global international trade issues, and now in the private sector, working with what I call owners and operators of critical infrastructure as they're trying to do exactly what you talked about, manage cyber and privacy risks, you know, and manage the, the, both the advent and the maintenance of what we call digital innovation and digital identity. Um, you know, you also talked about, and certainly we have seen in the pandemic, either tech can be the great equalizer or it is the great divider. You know, part of when we talk about digital identity and other things is we have to make sure that there's full and open access across the globe to all of these tools that we talk about. Um, there is also this unspoken pact between consumers, just normal society, the private sector and government, that they will be protected when you talk about their identity, when they're using digital tools and other things. And as we think about where we are, the World Economic Forum talks about the fourth industrial revolution. Others talk about the fifth, that combo really of um, automation or or computers and machines and humans. And the G7 and the G20 are looking at, you know, broader production revolutions. But but really inherent in that, what we're talking about is making sure that we're, we are understanding, aware of, and managing inherent risk, 
right? And it's a changing nature of risk. I talk about run of the mill theft back in the day, right? Now we're talking about nation states attacking each other. When you talk about privacy in the past, you know, maybe you were worried about online fraud. Now you're talking about the potential complete loss of a global identity or a digital identity. There are really five things I always say that people, um, companies and governments need to look at, because as we think about these issues, we are looking at a global regulatory regime that I think is important. We need to make sure that we have harmonization across the system for things like AI, Internet of Things and others. But really the top five issues that everyone needs to focus on are cyber by design, privacy by design looking at who's building and writing code for any of the automation or the AI and machine learning tools. Um, we do need, as I mentioned, harmonization across the board. And we have we must ensure inclusion, right? Tech needs to bring people together, not divide it. But if we people who don't even have access to the internet or broadband wherever that you are, then that's a serious problem. Now, when we talk about digital identity, the uh, World Bank has done a number of very useful studies, as have other organizations, and it talks about inclusive and trusted digital identity. But the converse is 100% true. If we do not ensure that we have protections embedded in digital identity overall, when you talk about who you are and what you know, if it is exclusive and untrusted, you've actually lost the bottom, the complete foundation of what we talk about for technological innovation. Now, the globe has looked at this. The U.S. and the EU are looking at new regulations and mandates for artificial intelligence, Internet of Things. And I always used to say that the U.S. was probably ahead of how we looked at cybersecurity as a national security risk embedded in everything. So the U.S. was a little bit farther ahead than the EU, but the EU beat us by miles on privacy. But I'm not sure that people understand the EU, I think, is much farther ahead than the U.S. at this point about potential regulations on artificial intelligence, IOT, and actually even on cybersecurity issues now. The last thing I'll touch on, because I know we have a lot to go through today, when we talk about how we look at bringing together harmonization is very important. And that means allied nations like the G7, those who believe in uh, democracy and rule of law and sort of guardrails have to actually work together to make sure we're managing these risks. So the G7 does have a digital and technological minister's focus. They just met in the UK and they came up with a number of very important projects that I know we'll touch on all of these issues. Um, it's about a secure, resilient and diverse digital supply chain. We have to protect that. We have to talk about a framework for digital and technological standards. We need to talk about what free data flows mean. We have to talk about internet safety and protection of digital identities. And digital competition is 100% what we're looking for. But what we need is to stop um, the rush to market with new digital tools without protections embedded in it. So I'm going to stop there. I know we have a lot of other things uh, we can talk about, but uh, that should get us started. Thank you very much, Norma. Before I uh, go on with Will, uh, I don't know if it's happening with all, but uh, you are jumping around different places there might be, and Arun, you have left us and come back a couple of times. So there might be some technological problems going on in the background. If anybody does fall out, uh, please come back as soon as you can. Uh, and I'll keep the panel going with those that remain. Uh, there, seem, there seem to be some odd things going on, but that's what we're talking about today, right? All right, we'll take it away. Great. Hi, my name is Will Pelea. I'm the founder of Together. I've uh, been in the industry since I was a child, really, but uh, really dove in in the late 90s up until this moment. Um, and in doing so, I've kind of seen, you know, how the Internet, how technology has changed over the past 25 so years. And the one thing that's very interesting to me is that, you know, we do need new oversight models. Um, you know, I know that you know silicon valley kind of likes to be different and they like to say we are different and that you know um regulation would kind of take away that magic from them but uh, i'd like to take a step back because you know we really do need new oversight models for this fluid or has now become fluid technology you know curve that we're on um and i'd like to start 
you know, with a couple of quotes from former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt. Um, in 2013, uh, he said the internet was the world's largest ungoverned space. I definitely agree with that. It was probably, yeah, it, it still is. Um, and then now in 2020, he said, despite earnest efforts, the tech community has not de uh, demonstrated convincingly that it can regulate itself. And with that, you know, we really have to see, you know, where we stand as far as, you know, Internet capitalism. Um, a good example, I'll, I'll reference a Gallup survey from 2020. Um, it said 59% of Americans believe elected officials are paying too little attention to issues dealing with technology companies. And um, I agree with that, but I think it's so fluid. I think people are adapting and they're using protocols and models, you know, that are outdated uh, and can be outdated, you know, even as of a week. Um, so things need to change. Um, when you look back in the past, I mean, industrial capitalism, operated under the public interest obligations and you know existing agencies really reflect that industrial era in dealing with you know how do we you know make people honest how do we open up you know uh, uh you know uh, competition how do we create and, and maintain markets then you then from that it's you know consumer rights personal privacy uh and it, it goes really far um you know it's with oversight you know what are you going to do um and you know, uh, in the past, you know, we've had a time buffer technology. So new technology would come out. A few people or industries would benefit from it. And then we would adapt. Other people would come up to speed. The government would come up to speed in order to be able to regulate. And that buffer is gone now uh, because things are, as I said, so fluid um, as far as like new versions and new technology coming out. And, you know, we really needed that time buffer and, you know, as I've said before, I mean, governments cannot be a spectator here. Um, we, we can't allow digital companies to make the rules and drive the economy. But, you know, if there's no one there, if there's a vacuum, um, you know, they're going to you know, attempt to do it themselves. And, um, you know, that's you know, that's where the big questions come. I mean, the last meaningful legislation addressing new technology was the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And, and that really dealt with networks and not platforms. And so it needs to be addressed. But with that, I'll send it back. Thank you very much, Will. All right. Oh, thank you. Over mm -hmm. to you, Scott. All right. Well, uh, Scott Francis here. Happy to be here as well. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder at BP3. And I wanted to kind of bring that perspective to the conversation in that we focus on automation, operational excellence and operational improvements for our clients. And I think that is one area where, you know, the dig progress in digital transformation and digital technologies of all kinds have really, have really produced a bounty of corporate profits, you know, partly because of that automation uh, or the opportunity to automate at the same time, it's really improved the productivity of people, you know, in all walks of life. And I think there is a, a fear, though, around automation as well. If we're really going to share the benefits, I think we have to acknowledge that, that there's also a risk that we automate out jobs that uh, otherwise could go to someone who is still learning the, you know, how to navigate the corporate world. Uh, because precisely the things that can be automated tend to be the easier things to, for a human to do, right? And, uh, you know, and then, of course, there are lovely corner cases where, you know, and, and really valuable cases where you can automate something that no human could do. And th those are, you know, generally turned into big, valuable companies like Google, right? Um, you know, nobody's going to do the search for you, right? Uh, in a human way, right? So there are things that scale and algorithms that, that automation really provides. But I think if we're going to share those benefits, you know, we have a couple of challenges. I think one is, uh, you know, access that everybody has access to some sort of computing device. And, you know, we're fortunate that mobile devices have, you know, promulgated sort of around the world and to places where there are many places where it is the only computing device they have. And as those phones become more capable, uh, you know, they're able to do more with them. And so I think there are a lot of jobs where you might think automation has no place in that job or doesn't help that person. But, you know, all of us use might use phones to get directions to get from point A to point B. And I think the key is that we need more people to be empowered to tell the computers what to do, to enlist software and computing devices to help us through our through our jobs, through our daily lives. 
and rather than have the computers telling us what we need to do at work. And that could be, you know, the construction worker using uh, a phone to tell him where the next job site is and what the status of that job is so he can go check on it. Uh, it could be uh, someone in a, in a back office, you know, trying to approve uh, insurance claims. So there are many ways where automation can affect our lives. I think uh, a sort of secondary issue is it, when we automate things, we have a loss of identity of who is actually the actor behind this thing. And so you'll see a lot, of, a lot of government websites won't let you use an automated way of interacting with the website because they want a human to do it. They want to know that it was Scott doing it uh, or Will doing it and not some random you know, piece of software. So there are some interesting identity issues to resolve of agency. You know, when is this piece of software acting on my behalf and when am I acting on my own behalf? And what are the legal, legal and, and liability differences there? Um, but I think to me, it all boils down to making sure that we take a, a real positive or, or lean forward approach to helping people create on computing devices. And so that isn't just I, I just want to emphasize it isn't just writing code, but leveraging software to make their, their lives better. And that could be whether you're writing an, an article or creating art uh, or NFTs uh, or whether you are writing code. And which is sort of the case that all of us in the tech world tend to focus on is more people should learn how to write code. But there are lots of ways to use your computer to program, if you will, to create a spreadsheet, to create your schedules, your calendars, your uh, email invites and, and things like that that are not code. But they do require some abstract thinking and uh, and familiarity with the computing device. Thank you very much, Arun. Over to you. Uh, absolutely, and uh, uh, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Arun Gaduri, uh, CISO, uh, VP Engineering and IT at uh, Innovacer, uh, and uh, for the past uh, almost a decade, uh, building startups, and one of them, the most recent one on cybersecurity and uh, identity. Um, uh, and that, uh, as, as you saw in the last few minutes, um, digital, going digital, uh, uh, e even in this kind of a world uh, in the U.S., they're always bound to have Internet connectivity uh, with, with, uh, uh, with, with me going uh, out and back in. Now, uh, in, in the world of uh, digital connectivity and, and where uh, digitization is going to every part of the globe, uh, and now with someone like SpaceX coming in and providing space and connectivity, it makes it easier uh, in the near future for everyone to get connected. Uh, but then digital identity uh, it, it comes down to, one, you have to have the right tools to say who you are. And someone in the system needs to approve that, yes, this is a room. And I certify. So, so I think there are two pieces of that equation. Um, and and uh, I think over, over the next uh, decade, we, we need to think, does this need to start global in the first place? Do we need to be global? How many people, yes, it's a digitized economy, uh, but if you go to the ground level in, in hundreds of millions of people, um, yes, they use the internet, but how much do they actually interact on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, so, uh, is there a need for local uh, identity resolution within countries and somehow making them interoperable? That is the key. Or do you need one complete global decentralized distributed network or some, some kind of a way someone can prove that, yes, this is me. And no matter where you go uh, in the digital world or in the physical world, someone knows that you, uh, it is you. Uh, and and I think that the the challenge on the individual side is how do you prove that you are you and how does the system accept that it is you? Uh, I think that uh, that that's where we, uh, those are two areas. I think we need to have very careful thought uh, because there is uh, a lot of potential for misuse and for hacking. Uh, uh, like one of those Hollywood and uh, Hollywood movies, someone with a click of button enters a building and they change the systems, they give the ID, and then they go in, right? Uh, how do you prevent those kind of things, someone taking over your identity, uh, be it secure? Where is that data stored? Who controls that data? All the privacy. So uh, privacy and controls around, uh, around that. So uh, I, I think th those are very important aspects. Well, thank you. So let me uh, pose uh, a question to all of you, because there are some things uh, that are common that are developing and identity is one of them. 
let me start by identity by saying that we think that we have the most secure identity document in a in our world up to now has been a passport uh, it is generally recognized as the one single physical uh, document that you have that says this is who you are uh, yet i can tell you from my work in uh, refugee and immigration affairs uh, over many years in the government of canada that there are literally hundreds of thousands of people that travel around the world every year without an identity document or they destroy that identity document en route for various reasons. Now, that's a physical document. So it is even more complicated when we think about the fact that we can't even have a physical document that is really secure than to bring us to the digital world. And right now, obviously around the world, and I have been part of some of these discussions, everybody is talking about whether we should have some kind of digital vaccine passport. Uh, and to me, in Ontario, I have uh, received a vaccine for COVID-19, the first shot. All I got was an email from the government of Ontario confirming that I had gotten the vaccine. It is incredibly easy, <laughs> literally just type, uh, incredibly easy for me to change the name, to change the birthday, to change any of the details I want, take that email and show it to anybody to prove uh, that I have been vaccinated or not vaccinated, depending on what I want to do. And I could be Joe Blow instead of my name. It's very easy to change. So there is a great deal of discussion going on around the world right now about the idea of having some kind of vaccine uh, document that says that you've been vaccinated, and that has brought up the identity issues in a great in a great way. So let me pose this question to our panel, and whoever wishes to lead us off may. The question is, to what extent do we need international cooperation uh, on these kinds of issues? Or does every country determine by itself uh, how do you establish your identity online? Uh, regardless of what the use is, I was giving you a vaccination passport or whatever you want to call it as one example, but obviously there are many, many other examples, but that just is a very current one. So to what extent do we need regulation, both on the international and on the national level? You've talked about artificial intelligence. We've talked about the differences between the Europeans, and I used to live in Switzerland for 10 years, and uh, the North Americans, for example. Uh, where there's a complete difference in opinion right now. Uh, so what? how do we go forward on this? To what extent should we be regulated? To what extent should we not be regulated? Who would like to lead us off? If I could stop for one comment. Okay. And then that okay, I think... Stop, stop and then Norma, please. You uncovered something I think really interesting for us, which is that we tend to think about identity and being able to prove our identity as a positive. And of course, if you're looking at it in that lens, then you want some kind of global coordination. You want every country to know who you are, make it easy for you to travel across borders and things like that. I think what you un uncovered in that, uh, uh, in that discussion is there are also cases where your identity can hurt you and uh, prevent you from having access to services, prevent you from having access to a country to travel. And so I think uh, that's an element that, you know, when we're talking about digital identity, we don't often discuss that sometimes identity is, is used against you, right? So I think there's a, um, I think we have to acknowledge that there are cases where maybe we need to solve for or provide a more humane, you know, treatment of folks who, who feel that their identity is, is going to be hurtful to their cause. Not for their own reasons, but, you know, for external reasons. I understand. Norma? So, you know, here, here's the good news and the bad news. The good news is we don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? You know, we, we believe in having a, an identity that can be proven so you have access to issues, right? But we, but 
we have driver's licenses in the United States and our countries have different tools. We have passports, right? The whole point is that there's the ability to have, to believe in rule of law, to have national security awareness, right? To, to be able to find criminals and identify other issues and risks. So it's a double-edged sword. So what, honestly, whether it's a piece of paper and that passport you hold in your hand or digital identity, we've already established the foundations. There should be certain data points that you need to have about an individual. And then there has to be some level of global harmonization for what that is. Now, the problem of refugees is a very difficult one, you know, and that is just not as easily managed in this situation. We do talk about a digital identity that that those who don't have a bank account or other things or who, you know, are pure refugees could have on blockchain, you know, on a digital ledger that is that is something that can be accessed around the world. But what is important is that there's commonality on the data fields on what we're collecting and how you're proving your identity. And then the last piece I'll say and stop is Cybersecurity is incredibly important, right? This rush to put everything somewhere in some digital form, you know, I think is was exciting 15 years ago. And now to me, you know, is a frightening concept because we need to look at the cyber risk first, right? If you have a pure digital identity and I steal it and sell it on the dark web, oh, wait, I can do that right now, then, you know, you're at a terrible loss. So I think it's, you know, one, don't recreate the wheel, two, look at the demographics and the populations we're trying to serve in a digital identity. And three, you do need global harmonization. Yeah. Uh, really? and, yeah. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So even, even today um, in, in the paper world, right. Uh, you have a passport and let's say you're applying for something in, in your city. Um, uh, just that alone doesn't uh, uh, prove that uh, or rather it's not fully trusted. You're asked for, hey, give me passport and give me something else to prove that it is you. I mean, passport should be the de facto standard, but then even that is not completely trusted. Uh, and and how a passport is uh, is uh, issued in one, and, and the main reason is because how a passport is issued in different countries, uh, uh, one may not trust the other. Uh, 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 in terms of how someone got hold of the password. And that's why uh, you're asked to provide multiple, uh, one of the reasons. Now, now the same thing on, 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 uh, in terms of um, uh, regulations, uh, I, I think that's where, uh, I think it, it is important in one way on uh, going back to what I mentioned uh, as to how do you prove that it is you? Uh, it, that is a very important question uh, like you may be at some part of the world, you prove to that local government or the local entity there that it is you, but then how does someone else at the completely different end of the world trust that entity in making that decision? Uh, so I, I think uh, I think that's where coming to a common regulations, common standards, open standards uh, on on how you prove uh, who you are and how someone else certifies it is you, uh, I think that that's very important. Okay. Will, do you have any thoughts from you? Yeah, uh, for me, I think when the consumer became the product, and as a number of years ago, that's when it really was, was a wake-up call, at least for me, in regards to trying to find a way to define yourself, assert your identity, but also be able to shield yourself from harm and from misuse. And um, for an example for me um, with Together, um, it's an app that you give to the homeless that allows them to be able to find out where they are. It puts all of their services together in one place for them to be able to, you know, be able to get food, get clothes, et cetera. Um, on the other side of that, it also allows the government to be able to kind of add them back to society. Um, the issues that I had is when I first started, um, the technology that was out there for like homeless people uh, is connected to our social security system uh, and it's called the Homeless Management Information System and it is very old. It's technology, but literally it's almost 30 years old. Um, and when I went in and said, okay, we need to be able to harness this and be able to share some of it with the people so that they while they're homeless, it gives them some hope or some feeling that, okay, I have, you know, I have control over my destiny. 
Um, but on the other side, allowing the government to say, okay, now this person, we know where they are now, you know, great. We can provide services to them. You know, they're going to pay taxes. They can get, et cetera, et cetera. And when I ran into that, the, the systems are very antiquated and, you know, um, the government licenses a lot of technology and have been doing so since the nineties, at least. And, um, those big industries, you know, they get their money every month and it's very, they're very resistant to change. It's just kind of like, um, kind of like technology. I mean, we're kind of in the double decades now for some of these companies and, um, you know, look how long we've had, we've had Microsoft Word. I mean, you know, I think for me, I think it's a time for older technology to be possibly made open source and given to the people um, because companies should be innovating, not just kind of keeping the dust off of old products and, you know, patching them for latest operating systems. Um, seeing the open source community and the things that I've been involved with, if you made some of that old stuff, even like Word, free and open, it creates a whole new economy of individuals creating things and being able to add to that technology. And um, my issues that I have now with blockchain is that the, the chain can be modified by consensus, okay? And if that's their trust. But the thing is, who are those people that are making the judgment? Who is those stakeholders that are making that consensus? And uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you, Will. Mm -hmm. So before I move on with my own questions, I just want to do, point out to participants that you're welcome to ask questions to the panel. Uh, please just write your question in the comment section. I can see them, and I'll be happy to pass them on in a few remaining minutes that we have if you have any questions. If not, let me go on. And I'm going to pose a general question again. This, this is something that Scott brought up, in particular automation, artificial intelligence. We've all seen for decades the... I'm so sorry, that's me. How is this happening? Uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I have, uh, always have several computers open. Um, so uh, the, the question comes up... Um, in automation, we've all seen the fictitious uh, science fiction movies where, you know, automation takes over uh, various machines, uh, take over the world and so on. So without regulation, is that possible that we move not to the extreme of that we see in science fiction movies, but is it possible that we go too far in art automation? Is it possible that we go too far in artificial intelligence uh, and that we as a human species need to remain in control? And if, if you think so, what do you propose in terms of the next uh, few years where obviously we are accelerating? I have read a fascinating report recently that said that the human, that the knowledge we have in the world in the next 25 years, new knowledge that we will gain in the next 25 years in the world will equal to all the knowledge of humanity up to this point. That mm -hmm. in the next 25 mm -hmm. years, we'll have the same amount of knowledge being, new knowledge being gained. Scott, why don't you lead us off on this? Ooh, I can't hear you. You're on mute, I think. You're muted, Scott. Indeed, indeed. I, I, I apologize. You'd think a year and a half in, I, I would know how to use the mute button. Um, but there's some fascinating science fiction on this topic. You know, if you're if you're interested uh, in reading, uh, Werner Vinge does some great speculative fiction about what is the ultimate consequence of a continuously accelerating rate of technological advancement. And, uh, you know, and you end up with some very interesting possible outcomes, right? And of course, you know, science fiction tends to lean toward the dystopian, which which his work does, but it gives you some food for thought about, you know, at some point the technology just changes so fast, you can't, it can't be adopted very equally around the world, right? And so you end up with these real 
uh, significant dislocations. And then you look at the world and you say, well, isn't that what's happening, right? Like we have these significant dislocations, you know, or, or, or disconnects between uh, parts of the world just based on the distribution of uh, what might be considered the near future of technology. And so I think you're, to your point, it's very important that we leave humans in control. I think if you just look at something like autonomous driving, we all accept that when a driver makes a mistake, people might get hurt. And we accept that it's a mistake because it's a decision they make in the moment when they make a mistake and they rear end somebody or they, you know, have an accident. Um, when a computer controls and drives the car, the decision about the prioritization of who to protect and who not to protect is made in advance. And that is a very different ethical decision to make. Do I protect the rider, the passenger in the car, or the pedestrian, or the other car that has people in it? How many people does it have in the car, right? Like, those are decisions that made in advance are really hard for us as a, as a species, as a society to make. And so I think it's important in, in many respects to leave humans in charge. And, uh, and I think although the pace is increasing, I think that still um, we imagine that there's that AI will do more than it than it likely will, right? I think the general intelligence notion is probably uh, still an exaggeration in terms of near future. Um, you know, even just driving cars has turned out to be much harder than the folks who were bullish about it. Uh, you know, thought by now we were supposed to have fully autonomous driving, and uh, you know we're still not there. So, any at any rate, I'll, I'll turn it over to to others who might have different perspective on it. No. Yeah. You know, the thing the thing I love about this question is that this this is today's reality. This is not science fiction. These are things that people are dealing with in the millisecond. And I do believe it is incredibly important to for um, there to be regulation on AI and machine learning. And right now we do have mostly machine learning, not AI. But the inputs are only as good. That output of the artificial intelligence is only as good as what we put in it. If there are no mandates that there be ethics installed in AI or the respect for rule of law, um, the value of life. There are many people who believe that, you know, full AI will be more efficient and effective than humans. And that's certainly true. But if you have no ethics and don't believe in human life, well, then that's pretty easy to build in. Um, the bigger issue too, you know, I mentioned the EU has a proposal for regulation for harmonized rules across artificial intelligence. I think that that's important. You know, you have to feed those inputs in existing laws, ethics, safety at the front end. And I think that that is important. There are some people who believe that the tech innovation, you know, needs to go without any of these, you know, harmful uh, regulations to stifle innovation. But I think AI is very different. Um, the last thing that I'll say about AI and automation, especially, is I don't think that, that companies all realize, and I have these conversations all day long, some good, some not so good, that when you, you are building full automation and AI and taking out the human role, then guess what? You have shifted the responsibility back onto yourself, on the company, full corporate responsibility for the safe use of the technology. And so I think that dialogue between, like, who's in responsible, who should be held responsible, um, also needs to be managed as well. Yeah, uh, uh, now in terms of the kind of uh, robot, uh, robot movies taking over the world, uh, I, I think we're still away from that, but, uh, but, but there is some kind of a takeover that may be possible, not to the extent of robots, but if you, if you look at where our lives are now managed. Uh, it's completely managed by the by the likes of Amazons and Googles and Microsofts, right? My home is completely Google. Uh, it's everything. I've got Nest points everywhere, uh, and 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 the door locks and cameras and and everything, right? And and uh, Amazon is now uh, 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 making their devices share every home's internet with each other. So Amazon Sidewalk is is launching, uh, and that is a reality. This is not science fiction. So which means that if you're in a community with, with hundreds of houses, oh, they're all talking to each other uh, some way, right? Uh, and, and then your houses, your house, your life is already taken over by this technology. But then do you look at it as taken over, or do you look at it as automation that is helping you be more efficient, uh, 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 et cetera? So... Um, yeah, it, it, it certainly is something that uh, uh, we need to ponder. Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, we're running out of time. Will, I'll give you the last word. 
Sure. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Other than, you know, wrapping up, um, the thing with technology and with AI, um, we make AI, so our bias goes into AI. We can try to clean it and be effective, maybe too effective. Um, but when you think of AI, you should think of them as cave people. They're very simple. They have, they have simple tasks. They have simple wants. And they don't take us into consideration. Um, and that's happening now. I mean, we're even kind of what they say, nerfing AI so that it can actually be as slow as we are so that we can deal with it. Just imagine a few years from now. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, on that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to end. I know that <laughs> this panel could have gone all day. Uh, we just barely scratched some of these uh, very important topics. But uh, on behalf of all the participants and our assets, I'd like